straight away. Fantastic. So it looks like everybody can hear me. So I'm just going to begin. So just to introduce myself, my name is Chantal Newton and I'm the marketing manager at the UK Contact Centre Forum. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join our webinar session today, which is being hosted in partnership with Contact Centre Panel. And today this session, uh, in this session, we'll be discussing uh, more insights into outsourcing. Just a couple of housekeeping points to go through before we begin. We do have some house, uh, sorry, some polls for you to participate in today. So when prompted, uh, the polls should appear automatically on your screen and please vote uh, when we say they're live. Uh, after the presentation today, we will be holding a full Q&A session. Please post any questions that you may have for our panel in the Q&A box provided. The webinar session is expected to last approximately 45 minutes. If you're unable to stay the whole session, the webinar is being recorded and the link will be emailed to all participants within 24 hours of the webinar ending. So to get today's session started, I'm gonna pass you over to our session chair, Jonathan Billing from Contact Centre Panel. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, Chantel. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome today to our webinar. Um, we've got a, I've got a really excited topic today. We've got, we've got some um, excellent uh, panelists from some leading organisations. Um, the objective of today's webinar is to, is to gain some insight into uh, outsourcing across different geographies. Um, and uh, like I said, we've got some excellent panelists who will be able to give their views um, and insight into, the, into their areas of operation. Um, so. The, the big topic we're going to try and cover as much as we can. If there are areas which um, we don't manage to cover and you've got questions on, please, please ask those through the Q&A um, and we'll try and get to you after the session, if not within the session. So I'm going to start by um, introducing each of the panelists um, and asking them to give a bit of an overview about their business and, and themselves. Um, I'm going to start off by, by with Phil, Phil Kitchen. Well, do you want to give us a, a bit of an insight into what the panel does and how they help customers? Yeah, delighted to. Thank you. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, nice to be part of the panel. So um, just a brief introduction. CCP uh, fundamentally is a network of uh, over 130 outsourcers, best of breed, uh, all three of which um, panel members are clearly part of that. And we help clients find the right contact centre partner. Great. Uh, Dino, do you want to give us a bit of uh, insight into your organisation? Yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so VentureCo is a multilingual customer management outsource. So we have in the region of about 1,800 staff uh, currently, and we provide customer service for a host of well-known brands uh, with a particularly strong focus on retail. Uh, we currently operate out of two sites uh, in the UK and they're augmented with significant home working capability. And we have two further sites planned later this year, one near shore and one offshore. Right. Um, so William, can you give us some information about Ascensos and um, any information about the business and your role? Sure, very happy to be here today as well, Jonathan. So uh, good to see everybody. Uh, Sensos is an independent provider of uh, customer management and engagement services. We support clients, um, customers around the world globally from our locations in the UK and near shore in Eastern Europe and in um, uh, Western Asia. Uh, very much looking at the bespoke solutions that we can offer our clients exclusively in e-commerce and, uh, and e-retail around that hybrid of of using technology, using people-led advisor services, um, and of course, work from home as we all do these days uh, to ensure that the customers get the, the best commercial flexibility that they need to grow in, in the markets that they choose. Right, thank you, William. Um, Robin, can you give us some insight into how it works and your role? Sure, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Robin Hoekstra, and I'm the co-founder and chief executive officer of Outworks Contact Center in South Africa. I'm also the chairman of the regional industry body called BIPESA here in South Africa and sit on the expo of our national governing body. Uh, Outrex is located on the southeast coast in a city called Durban. Uh, we've been operating since 2013. We've got about 1,500 advisors and we operate out of three delivery centers 24 seven, uh, providing services predominantly to the UK, USA and Australia. We're an English centric BPO we are a provider offering a range of competencies covering customer services, 
in and outbound sales, voice and non-voice and front and back office. And our channels include things like financial services and insurance, retail, media and communications, uh, telecommunications, medical. And whilst we only offer English from South Africa, we do deliver multiple languages from both Eastern Europe and South America. Great, thank you, Robin. Okay, so I'm gonna start off the, the conversation uh, discussion looking at uh, geographies. Um, so uh, when we talk about um, sort of UK nearshore, offshore uh, contact center operations, it's very easy to generalize. Um, but, but I really wanted to get some your thoughts on um, on, on what the merits are for those particular locations, obviously with, with uh, each of the panelists having their own perspective. Um, so Dino, could you, could you give us a view on, from a, from a UK perspective, um, the merits of, of having a, or using an outsourcer that's based in the UK? I mean, this is a subject that um, has been spoken about a lot in recent years, but I think everybody in our industry will have a view on this and of course it's, it's easy to generalize uh i mean for me poor customer service is, is poor customer service no matter where it happens and that can happen in the uk too um so clearly it's about um you know the chosen outsourcer and the quality of that outsourcer and their people but for me um the uk will always come out on top on quality amongst a host of other parameters uh, and, and, you know, if it's a, a commercially viable solution. Um, but, but certainly, Jonathan, I don't know if you want to talk about other parts, but certainly Eastern Europe has its merits uh, in terms of lower cost multilingual capability. But of course, you have to be sure that you're going to get the language capability from there. Yeah. Well, maybe William, it's a good time to ask William that question because I know, um, you know Census have um, operations across yeah. Europe. Yeah, um, for us, the, the real traction of the near shore is uh, given the work we do, particularly in e-commerce, um, it's about a mixture of proximity, but also that that access to multi-language, multilingual capability. Uh, I think where you've got a client and a brand which has a real spread, a general generous spread, if you like, of all the European languages and some minor languages as well, I think um, being able to access uh, as many of those native speakers as possible uh, is the benefit of, of the Eastern European sites. And we very much um, feel that the, the infrastructure that we have in, in Eastern Europe is, is pretty much second to none, particularly where we are in Bucharest, for example, which has recently been made the, uh, it's a long title, the EU HQ for the cybersecurity competencies. It's probably got a better fiber connectivity than the UK. Um, as well as a rich pool of, of uh, employees that, um, for example, in Bucharest, I think it's 33% of the entire university population is in, of, of Romania is actually in Bucharest. Uh, so there are just a few of the reasons why, why we certainly feel there's a, there's a huge benefit to clients that have that multilingual requirement of, of doing this sort of uh, near shore. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so Robin, just from a South Africa perspective, um, as an offshore provider, what, what's your thoughts? Well, you know, I, I think the one thing that we need to consider is the, the requirement from potentially the UK and let's call it uh, the, the, the US more, more importantly, is that South Africa is unashamedly an English centric destination. And I think what South Africa has proven and specifically if we speak to the last 18 months or so, the ability for South Africa to be resilient in the face of a, let's say, global pandemic like we've just experienced and are experiencing at the moment. So I think from a geographic uh, risk mitigation point of view, uh, timelines uh, follow the sun. South Africa offers a really amazing offshore destination uh, to, to many different geos. And I think with South Africa and the history that we have between South Africa and the UK specifically, because that's our target audience today. Uh, we've got over 20 years worth of experience in operating between the UK and, and South Africa. You know, we have an amazing talent pool in South Africa. And I think a lot of times our talent pool is underestimated. You know, if you look at the, the accent neutral, uh, the accent neutral capability of our staff, uh, the levels of EQ and empathy that we have here in South Africa. So, you know, again, people sometimes talk about distance. And, and if you talk to people in North America, more so than in the UK, you know, they will talk about the fact that you know, near shore is a lot more easy for them to travel to. Onshore has obviously its advantages. 
but the, the distance, if handled correctly, is, isn't really an issue because the majority of our clients uh, either engage by sending some of their execs over here, some of their trainers, some of their key account managers, and they spend time within the business. And that transition uh, is really managed well. Uh, with the onset of the virtual presence capability that we now have in our ability to almost be in each other's faces on a daily basis, I think the concept of offshoring, nearshoring, onshoring, you know, home away from home, uh, it's really not any longer an arm's length away. So I think there, there are many advantages. I mean, I can speak, uh, and I'm hopefully we'll get on to the key advantages of the various cities within South Africa, but I won't speak about that now, and hopefully we can circle back to yeah. that just now. Yeah, yeah. I think the key advantages for South Africa are its, it's timeline, it's, its location to the United Kingdom, its incredible talent pool, and um, its sophistication in terms of the infrastructure and its resilience as it's proven over the last 18 months. Yeah, yeah. So, so Phil, um, with Contact Centre Panel being uh, having an agnostic view of the market, what, what's your thoughts on the view? On yeah, I think, I think Dino made... Sorry, thanks, JB. I think Dino made the point right at the very start. I think it's quite difficult to generalise. I think... Um, we, we, we clearly work in all those, all these regions and clients have different requirements and demands, um, which therefore, you know, allows us to identify the appropriate geographies, um, you know, and those demands might be cost, they might be uh, cultural alignment, which no doubt we'll talk about a little bit later, they might be solution, which again, we'll talk about a little bit later, you know, we get we get clients that are clearly very UK centric and we're working on behalf of a big charity at the moment that, um, you know, wants the operation based solely here in the UK. But I think what I would say is that um, we get quite a few clients that maybe have a, a preconceived idea or a preconceived, a preconceived idea of the potential destination for either there sales or their customer service work. And as we work our way through the process, often that um, the, de the decision is not one that they felt they were going to make right at the very start in terms of geography. So I think, yeah. you know, and, I, and just to pick up on William's point, I think, um, you know, and again, I no doubt we'll pick, on, pick up on this a little bit later on because, you know, that Central European language hub is becoming more relevant in our opinion and we're doing a lot of work with clients that are looking to place work there but and no doubt William can comment more on this and already has done with respect to Bucharest but there is a there is a, a, a range of language availability in the different countries so quite clearly you know prospective clients have to be very careful especially if they're working at scale so I don't think you can generalize I think countries have you know different specializations and um, uh, uh, skills and requirements, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be our general view on it, I think, Jonathan. Okay, yeah. And um, I know we touched on it, Robin, but the uh, looking at sort of South Africa in itself, is, is, um, is, is there any areas within or differences within different areas or conurbations of within South Africa? Do you notice uh, um, or what's your views on that? Sure, I mean, if we look at the BPO market as a whole in South Africa, we've got a couple of really key cities and then a couple of emerging cities. We've got six key cities with both domestic and captive and international BPO operations, onshore captive operations are managed out of. Each reason has obviously got its own geographical and lifestyle offerings in these cities of different areas of government support, whether it's in skills training, special economic zones, various BPO, GBS parks, widespread broadband and connectivity. Uh, what we have seen is that many BPOs who choose to locate in South Africa start off in one region and then they land up spreading to other cities and access those skill pools and incentives to spread their risk and also look at various DR solutions and also to access a broader domestic client base. Cape Town and the Western Cape, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, was the initiator of much of the South African BPO success. And although the city still hosts the predominance of the seats servicing the international market, this has dropped to below 47%, with Durban having jumped from 24 to 37% in the past three years, which is quite significant growth down here on the East Coast. Johannesburg is the majority of our domestic and captive operations, with about 65% of the local market, and supports about 15% of 
of the export market with the Eastern Cape, with the two cities there, Port Elizabeth and East London, who are newcomers and considered viable, what we refer to as tier two alternatives with just under 2% of our export market and growing. So we've seen a number of BPOs looking at alternative cities for growth and to access alternative skill pools. And what the sector is well aware of is, is that we don't want to see one region over trading. So we drive up costs, which is why provincial government and cities have got a number of GBS focused yeah. initiatives, such as skills, uh, work skills, readiness, work readiness programs and skills interventions to make sure that we try and find some parity between these major cities. The GBS sector is recognized on the national economic agenda as a priority sector and has been supported as such by our yeah. provincial, local and national government. So, you know, each city has got its own unique capability. Cape Town being the nostalgic uh, winelands, Table Mountain and, and, and Robben Island with Nelson Mandela affinities and Durban on the East Coast, which originally the sales hub of South Africa, which has now really found parity and balance between customer service and sales. And Johannesburg, which has generally always been recognized as the sort of financial hub and more complex work. So I think each city has got its own unique offerings. Yeah. And from a resourcing perspective, is there, a, is there particular areas which are easier to source the right skill people, or um, does it tend to be, you know, is there no difference? Well, I, I, I don't think there's really any difference between any of the regions, to be frank. Yeah. Um, I think, as I say, the, the, the customer centricity or customer experience centricity is sort of really balanced right throughout the country now. Uh, you know, if you go back 10 years, maybe you would have said that Cape Town is the hub of customer service. Durban is the hub of sales and Johannesburg is the hub of financial services. But I think there's been an evolution where there's yeah. a lot more balance, not only between us as operators locating in various cities, but also for clients looking at different skill pools and, and not just sticking with one uh, demographic or group of people. So yeah. I think that the availability of skills, whether it's a Western Cape down here on the East Coast or in Johannesburg, uh, the availability of a willing group of skilled and talented youngsters is really there. We've got significant unemployment between 18 and 35. I think our unemployment is close to 60%. Yeah. So they are, you know, well-trained, well-educated, hungry, and, and desperately enthusiastic youngsters uh, who are ready and willing and able to work. Yeah, yeah. Thank, uh, thanks for that, Robin. Um, so William, William, just out of interest, uh, Sensos mm. are they've got they're, they're based operations in Turkey and Romania. Uh, why why didn't you look at sort of Western Europe? What was the thought of, of, of going for those locations as opposed to um, those in yeah Western Europe? Yeah, sure. I think um, the real decision was around that commercial flexibility which Nearshore offers. I think even several years ago, talking to some clients, not clients of a Sensos, but but previous clients I was engaged with. Um, there was always already a sense that some of the Western European locations for multilingual were starting to heat up in terms of their price points. And they were getting to the point, really, there was a parity uh, with the, the UK, obviously not across all sectors or all uh, capabilities, but there was generally a sense that it, it was, I guess, a slightly overheated market. And also, um, there's a lot, I think, in, in my experience, a lot more movement between the Western European countries than there is in the East. Uh, and again, that affects retention, that affects, you know, um, the peaks and troughs and the availability of quality uh, staff simply because they are um, moving from perhaps one part of Portugal, for example, to another or from Portugal to another country. Yeah. Um, Eastern Europe, uh, in our uh, experience, is is better in that regard. And, and also, um, I visited Kosovo about a year and a half ago, and I was hugely impressed with what they've got in terms of, again, that inward and outward perspective, but wanting to bring what they learn from beyond their particular region back into Kosovo. And I think that is, is a character almost of the, the what we see in Eastern Europe, which I think is really important to what we offer. Are there any sort of, that, I know you probably don't want to say this, but any sort of negatives for, the, for those locations? Um, in a particular order, you know. Um, the traffic can be a bit bad in Bucharest, yeah. if I'm absolutely honest. Um, but then, you know, these days traffic's bad anywhere. It well, is yeah. where I am at yeah. the moment in London, but that's about it. And uh, I think the other thing I'd probably add then is we're also looking, particularly with e-commerce, what's happening out east, uh, hence our setting up in, in Istanbul. 
and we're in Western Asia, so we're on the yeah. um, the Asian side of Istanbul, and that again gives us access to um, Middle Eastern languages as well as Russian and uh, languages which are starting to come again a bit more to the fore in what you know, particularly e-commerce and online organizations want. Spe specifically, when you think of what's happened with these organizations after the year we've had and their huge growth. And then recruitment is is that how's that how's that uh... Uh, recruitment. I just spoke to a recruitment person yesterday about Eastern Europe. It's very competitive. Uh, and that's really because we do, um, well, what they're seeing is a Brexit influx of, of many people going back to the, lang the, the countries where they come from uh, over the last year and a half or so on. Uh, so there's, there's, we don't find it difficult, but, and certainly the quality is there anyway in, in quite a, a broad yeah. labor pool. But yes, it's recruitment is recruitment. There's good days and bad days, if you like, yeah. but, but certainly we've had not a problem. Okay, um, so just want to ask a question around around channels. Um, so, is there an argument um, to place different channels within different geographies? Um, so, so Dina, do you, do you want to give us your view on that? Um, I'm not so much so sure about um, channels as such. I mean, you know, you could clearly argue digital channels are um, maybe from you know the written skill side of things are better placed in the UK. Certainly. You know, there are uh, various skills that you would, um, even if you, you take a destination like the Caribbean, you would say, look, if you've got sales type work, then you might consider Jamaica over Barbados, for example. And, you know, there are certain nuances around the type of work that you might put in certain destinations. Um, I think that, you know, that, that there is an argument to say that you would want the sort of more digital uh, work, particularly that, you know, that the written word over here in the UK is going to be is going to be better. So there's always an argument to that effect. But um, I'd say it's more around the skills and the type of services you want to outsource as opposed to channels. Yeah, yeah. So, to Phil, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I think I think interesting what Dino was saying there because funnily enough, we find sometimes the challenge is moving voice uh, initially offshore. Now I know Robin will comment on this, and you know, and we, we have a lot of voice now offshore, but um, but often that is transition. So some of our clients might start, funnily enough, with some of the channels that you've mentioned there, Dino. They might start with email and chat, and then over time they might move voice as a channel. And we've we've got a particular client out in South Africa that you know started with ten heads and is now at ninety heads including some heads on voice, but it's taken a bit of time for them to get their confidence up. I think that's probably right. I mean, it was a rapid, it was a rapid, you know, uh, movement to get voice up and running. Um, so within a relatively short period of time, they did that. But I think, I think you know, we definitely see that. Um, we definitely see uh, the whole point about transition. So the movement of irrespective of what the channel is from the UK to a near or far shore offshore operation. The, the only other thing I'd like to mention is that I think, um, you know, from a voice perspective, um, you know, we're definitely finding India as a bit of a challenge. There's no doubt about that. And interesting to see what other people have got to say on that. But, um, but yeah, so I think um, they would be our views from our clients anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so William, what are your thoughts? Are you... um, similar, but I would say I think there is a, a great opportunity. If we remember that these contracts run for three years, five years, there's a great opportunity with clients to look at the ways in which channels might start on shore, might move slightly near shore for some of them. And then I know for us, we've had great success with some clients that we built up small in the UK, uh, and then we've migrated all of it to our near shore destinations. But that really does take real buy-in from the client and, and tenure of clients. So they can really understand and we can work with them to understand what is the problem you're trying to solve for? Uh, have you got a robust business plan that we can speak to and work with you on that allows us to go on that journey with you over the lifetime of the contract? So I would say uh, there's definitely a, an argument for non-voice where you get uh, commercial flexibility and that might be near shore or offshore. Um, 
But I think as time goes on, I think we'll find more and more there's the ability, depending on sector scale and, and, and complexity, to do quite a bit near shore, even including voice. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Robin, um, Phil mentioned South Africa. Um, is, is there any nervousness around placing voice within South Africa? Have you seen that or experienced that? No, not at all. I mean, quite the contrary. The predominance of the export work that is done in South Africa is voice. Yeah. Right? South Africa was recently announced as the top global BPO offshore front office CX location uh, by the Ryan Strategic Advisory Omnibus Survey. And this speaks volumes for our CX voice capability. The country has been complemented and selected based on neutral accent. And English is our key language, where we service the United Kingdom and 63% of South Africa's BPO export market is serviced in English. So, you know, for us, uh, we have absolutely no reluctance to it. You know, we've got quite an eclectic mix of clients in, in our work specifically, where we've had clients who are concerned about placing voice in South Africa because of the Africanized accent. And, and what we found in, in almost every case without exception is that once they've experienced the nuances of our accent, they're actually quite intrigued by it. And for a lot of the customer service side of it, we, we, we've actually been complimented and, and it's been quite a hook and, and a key feature on why people are attracted to put some work out here. I mean, our, besides the English part of it, I think the South African uh, are, are generally quite friendly people. And, and I think the levels of EQ and empathy that are on the calls, the, 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 the willingness that the South African advisor has to try and solve a problem, not just point out the obvious and, and, and sometimes try and, you know, try and mitigate the blame that they have, but they just accept that there's a problem and, and deal with the problem at the time. We, we've got out of 60 million people, 20 million English speakers. Yeah. Uh, and we're adding about 400,000 new English speakers annually to the workforce. So from, from that point of view, I think we've got a superior English talent. So absolutely no reluctance whatsoever uh, to place English in South Africa and to place voice in South Africa, more importantly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as far as languages are concerned, is, is, is there limitations there, would you say? Or obviously English is a very strong language. Are there other, other, other languages which you would focus on or is it predominantly in English? Look, it's, it's, it's unashamedly English focused. Uh, yeah. And I've mentioned that before. High quality, medium cost, but competitive English service destination. Uh, having said that, we do uh, service multilingual capabilities out of South Africa, but in very small pockets or very small buckets. You know, we, we've got English schools, French schools, German schools, Italian schools, and other European schools here in South Africa. But the one thing we can't yeah. claim is to be in a position to offer multilingual at scale in South Africa, for, for instance. But what we would do is, is offer... Uh, the ability for a client to, to place a couple of seats here with us and maybe tens and twenties, and that we definitely have an ability to service. But I would suggest that it would be far better suited to a, a near shore capability uh, for lots of the European languages yeah. and potentially South America, where we also do place quite a bit of work yeah. uh, for near shore USA. So, so Dina, it'd be good to get your perspective, obviously, with Brexit, and, and we're here about. Yeah. Uh, the effects of that. Uh, have you noticed that from a language perspective, finding people who are multilingual, lingual, have, have linguistic skills in certain areas? Yeah, I mean, it, there have undoubtedly been some challenges. Um, you know, we've had some of our uh, multilingual staff sadly decide to go back to, to their respective countries. Um, also, we've seen a, a reduction in the recruitment pool. I mean, our, our policy has always been to recruit mother tongue. Uh, that's really, really important to us from a quality standpoint. And so that, that, uh, that's definitely affected us. What I'd say, though, we've, we've, we've offset that with the expansion of our, our home working capability, though. So that's really, really helped um, fill the gap, if you like, um, and overcome some of the challenges that, uh, that Brexit um, has caused. But, you know, I think that's why we, later on this year, will be setting up a, a multilingual hub in Europe really to continue supporting and augmenting what we're already doing from the UK and out of uh, parts of Europe with home workers currently. Yeah, yeah. And then, William, would you, would you echo that from, your, from a census perspective? Have, have you have you noticed that with the, with the move into Eastern Europe, has is that, is that helped from a, from a language perspective and offering uh, 
Um, yeah, no, absolutely. You know, and and I, I guess I would highlight here what we're doing in uh, Istanbul and Turkey because one of the most difficult languages that I think we all appreciate is is German to to resource for, um, and Istanbul certainly with that uh, great relationship between Turkey and Germany has given us an additional um, capability and a very strong capability that allows us to access German. You know, it's it's had borders for places like um, Apple in the region, but also Lufthansa are based there. So it really does give us a, a handle on that particular language. But yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, absolutely, as, as, as Dino points out, that near shore ability, and especially with the work from home, really being able to employ people where they are uh, and allow them to continue to work where they're based, rather than being in a, a certain radius of our sites is, is key, I think, to the next 18 months, 24 months build out of these types of operations in Europe. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've just had a question come in actually regarding costs. Um, I'll read it out. So in terms of price point, how does South Africa compare to, to Eastern European market, the Eastern European market? What is the average starting salary for a customer support agent in Bucharest versus Joburg? Um, we, we are we're going to talk about um, pricing and, and costs. And uh, I think well, one of the questions I've, I've got was around um, so average uh, percentage differences between geographic areas. Um, I don't know if you want to answer that one, Robin. Do you want to, do you want to start with that one or, or Phil? Um, I'll unmute and then that would be easier, wouldn't it? So, <laughs> well, yeah. Generally, uh, I mean, from a cost perspective, I find it absolutely fascinating in terms of the, the range of, um, call it hourly rates, uh, across... Um, across Europe, most certainly across Europe, um, a, a real broad variation, of course, broad variation. And again, I'm sure Robin will comment on this, but we do find the same in South Africa. But I would um, come back to Dino's point that, you know, cost is just one part of the equation. Of course it is. And what's the most important part? It is delivery. There's no doubt about that. You know, the quality of customer service or clearly clearly sales you know we all know that um a cheap hourly rate does not necessarily deliver a low cost of sale for example if we were to just focus for a minute on the outbound sales process um uh, and what, but what i would say just to sort of bang the south african drum because we've just done an exercise on behalf of a client which is inbound retention and we were at pains to point out for the to the client that you know, um, what, what could be considered a lower hourly rate in, say, South Africa compared to the UK um, may not equate to, you know, um, a, a, low, a low cost of retention. In fact, it might equate to a higher cost of retention. And interestingly, what we are finding, and again, throw it over to Robin to comment on this, but we are finding you know, um, in terms of delivery and success, um, you know, super, superb cost to retain out of out of South Africa. Um, you know, so, um, but so the, yeah, the general point is, you know, range, range of prices across Europe. I'm sure William will be able to comment on that. Um, and then within selective countries, surprisingly enough, you know, we've just done an exercise on behalf of the client whereby in one particular country, we've seen a, a shift of about 30% from one outsourcer to the other, um, all, all of which clearly are very reputable outsourcers. So that's not necessarily the issue. So um, yeah, no, throw it over to everybody else to comment on that, on that, on that particular point. Okay, Robin, do you wanna give your view? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think the one thing I just wanted to say just at, at the outset is, South Africa is not a cheap destination. Right? We, we don't market ourselves a, a, as a cost play. Uh, I, I think we're a very uh, medium priced, quality driven uh, destination. So you know, what, what's our prices? And if you compare them, not necessarily to Eastern Europe, unless they compare them to the UK, uh, in general, you'd probably find a, a 40 to 45% cost reduction in the price per hour. But as, as Paul was saying, you know, you, you do find in South Africa at the moment, even necessarily just in other geos, you, you can get 25 to 30 percent difference between service providers, between, let's say, Durban and Johannesburg or Durban and Cape Town and, and, and likewise. So, you know, again, I think it's 
it, it's the choice of the geography. You, you need to decide what it is you're looking for, first of all. And it's not just necessarily price, because if it's price, it's going to India, the Philippines, potentially. But if, if you're looking for a quality destination, South Africa is a good option. And, and what we find a lot of our clients do, they, they have work in the UK, they've got work in South Africa, and they use a blended rate back to their clients. So if they've got a contract, which is a headline contract in the UK, they'll place, let's say, 50% of it out in South Africa. And our experience suggests that they get close to potentially a nearshore blended rate uh, or, or, or a significantly cheaper rate than just keeping it all onshore. But it, it's definitely not just a pure cost play, uh, for sure. Uh, and, and, and as Phil was saying, and I, I think Jonathan mentioned as well, I think what's critically important is, is to get the brief right when you start, is what is the expectation of outcome from the client themselves do they actually understand what it is they're trying to achieve? Rather than moving the old acronym, the same mess for less, it's really a case of understanding the true essence of what they're trying to achieve and then trying to formulate with them. We, you know, we, we've had opportunities where we've suggested that they should not place all the work here with us in South Africa, but they should entertain a bit of nearshore, for instance, just to, just to complement the entire suite of the solution in which they're trying to engineer. Okay. And then William, what's your thoughts? Well, I would echo a lot of uh, what the others have said. And I think it is this uh, idea for the client to keep the main thing, the main thing. What is it they're trying to achieve? Um, and I think, if I'm honest, the even the term outsourcing and BPO, uh, we're ill-served by those titles because of the complexity and the value we actually bring to partners isn't really reflected uh, in the sort of discussions around where can I get it cheaper, as, as Robert yeah. says, mess for less. Um, it is about actually saying, you know, have you even considered is doing nothing an option? Have you actually looked at that internally in your organization? Uh, have you modeled it properly? I.e., we're going to do nothing. We're not going to engage in outsourcing. What does that look like? Is it something that we can then maintain and sustain over the life of what might be an outsource contract length of three to five years? Um, is, is the procurement team invested in that vision as well? Uh, so it, it is about what's the problem you're trying to solve, what's the complexity of the scale of it, how will that change over the lifetime of the contract, uh, and therefore where is the right place for your customers and your customers' engagement that might be a mix of all the solutions we've, we're, we're speaking about on the webinar today. Okay, yeah. Do you know? Well, I mean, I think everyone uh, echoing everybody's points are a valid point. Sure. I mean, I would, yeah. I would disagree on, on one point, though, that I think when an offshore destination is chosen, it's it's 100 percent always chosen on a cost play because there's absolutely no reason to go offshore um, unless it's a cost play. But but look, you know, there are you know, there are uh, there are clear benefits. I mean, you know, if you look at. South Africa, Philippines, India, these are all well trodden paths. You know, they're well established. Um, the thing I'm sure we're going to come on to technologies, but. Yeah, you know, absolutely. You know, I, I actually, just, that. sorry, Dean, sorry to keep you short. It's just, it's interesting. Quite a question was asked by the chat. By the way, if you can ask a question, if you could do it through the Q&A, it makes it easier than the chat, just to, just for the audience. Um, but it was, it was asking around um, new, I guess, up and coming destinations such as Jamaica, Honduras, Honduras uh, Nigeria, um, it's saying for, for English, Spanish, even French service delivery. Um, so they're asking around considering smaller outsources uh, as they're, they're very flexible and can act, act faster than the bigger players. Um, what's your thoughts on that, Dino? I mean, I think Jamaica's a, a great up and coming destination. I mean, it's a, of course an ex-British colony. Uh, English is their, is their first language, <clears throat> got very similar cultural um, uh, tendencies as, as we do here in the UK. Um, so, it, and, and again, I would say that it's, um, it's more up and coming. Uh, all right, typically, if you take the time zone, Jamaica would typically service the US, you know, yeah. five hours behind. But it's actually no different from going to India where you would start five hours later. In Jamaica or elsewhere in the Caribbean, Antigua, wherever you might decide to go, you'll start five hours earlier. Um, there's a lot of talk around Egypt at the moment to cover both both um, language and 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 the, provide the cost arbitrage piece. Uh, so there's a there's a lot of up and coming destinations, and and um, I mean this whole 
additional conversation yeah. I could spend yeah. hours on. But, um, well, Phil, you've probably got a good perspective of this, haven't you? Yeah, well, I, I, I think Dino's absolutely right. I mean, we're, what we're talking about here is, you know, the breadth of potential, aren't we? You know, the, the world's a relatively small place. Um, you know, when we start looking at the various locations and, um, you know, I mean, just to sort of e echo and uh, sort of confirm what Dino's just been saying, and I'll, I'll throw in another country, Dino, I'll throw in Albania. You know, so very, very interesting destination. You know, we, we've just placed two bits of work in Albania with two different providers. Um, and clearly, um, again, William will be able to comment on this, but in terms of language capability, you, you know, um, at the moment, Albania, you know, well, Albania can definitely cater for a multitude of different languages, which is great, is relatively well priced and the, and the comments that we're getting back from clients that are already out there, you know, because quite clearly on behalf of the clients that we work with and the outsourcers references are taken, the quality of service is, is exceptional. Now, whether that will continue, we all know that, you know, um, the, there are sometimes some challenges in terms of, um, you know, a multitude of contact centers opening up in selective locations and therefore, you know, price goes up and the availability of, of staff diminishes, um, you know, so I, no doubt there are certain challenges on that. But I think, you know, again, to pick up on the Kosovo stroke Sarajevo um, stroke discussion or point that, again, William was making earlier, we've got work out in Sarajevo. Su superb in terms of the quality of, of agent, you know, a war-torn country, um, you know, agents, um, you know, went to university across Europe and are now heading back to Sarajevo. So a talent pool second to none, really. Yeah. Um, you know, so some very interesting, you know, debates and discussions, I think, around so many different locations, but you know everybody has their strengths and the weaknesses. I yeah, I mean, I, mean, I want to touch on. There's a question actually we've we've had and uh, from from earlier on. Also, uh, it's, it's something I was going to ask as well around the, the, the cultural elements. I do want I do want to uh, cover the the impact of automation and technology on on costs um, and delivery of service. Um, but I'll, I'll just I'll just read out what the question is. Um, so for offshore, nearshore locations, especially for UK clients, customers, uh, how do you immerse your advisors in the UK type of culture so they can deliver a similar experience to what they would get within the UK? So, um, Robin, do you want to join us to start with that one? Yeah, sure. I mean, South Africa's got a long history with the UK and previously been part of the Commonwealth. There's an obvious deep cultural alignment. Uh, there's yeah. a number of British expats in South Africa and vice versa. And our largest international client base stems from the UK with over 60% of our export market being serviced into the UK. We're educated in sort of British English, if, if that makes sense. And many of our schools teach on the Cambridge system. Many of our universities are affiliated to UK universities and tertiary education facilities. Our legal and banking system is based off the UK system. And we've got an abundance of UK brands operating in South Africa. So home away from home, really, just maybe with a little bit better weather. But, but, but I would, <laughs> it's not hard though. <laughs> but, but I would suggest with almost 20 years of, of, of offshoring between our geographies that the, the cultural alignment between the UK and South Africa is very deeply entrenched. Uh, and, and, you know, it, when we're teaching our advisors and, and, and sort of uh, exposing them, especially those who have been underprivileged and unable to travel and unable to be exposed to the internet, uh, at a young uh, a young age, you know, it's a case of immersing them in British culture and exposing them to to the nuances of of how British people think and and how the the British mindset works and you know confrontational uh, and, and pushback and and how that all works and you know the levels of sarcasm yeah. can and can't be used potentially. So yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I think we we we're very good at that in South Africa specifically. Yeah. So, so, so William, I mean, you'll see it from a different perspective from the, with Eastern Europe, with you know, Istanbul and Romania. Mm. Um, how, how does that affect? Uh, do, how do you get a cultural alignment when you to be talking to UK customers? Um, I think, let's be honest, these are all easy, accessible destinations from the UK. You know, two hours, two and a half hours to Bucharest, a couple of hours to uh, Istanbul. So, and it goes both ways. And I think there's a huge amount of... Um, 
cross-cultural alignment and all these things anyway, particularly when you're supporting e-commerce and, and retail. Um, you know, all of that's on Instagram, all of it's in uh, on YouTube, through vlogs and all the rest of it. Um, and so the, the kind of people that work for us are also the kind of people who are the customers of the brands that we support. So there's yeah. already a huge cultural alignment. I think what we definitely could all agree on is we're, we're miles away from those kind of cultural alignment workshops that we used to hear about that needed to be required offshore, uh, even offshore. Those they, That just doesn't exist anymore. I, as a, both a customer of banks like HSBC, um, but also um, talking to many of the colleagues and former colleagues I've had at Global BPOs, the days when those kind of, we, ca we can't get your culture, I think, for me, I think they're long gone, certainly near shore. Um, they just don't really exist in the way Perhaps it's it's more the nuance and the, the subtleties, yeah. but but even they are now things that I think can really be easily visited because online is so ubiquitous. Yeah, uh, is that your view, Phil? What's what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, exactly the same. I think um, I think we have an educational challenge in terms of educating sometimes our our customers in terms of the ability of offshore and offshore. Um, partners and their agents to align um but i think that's you know relatively quickly overcome um, just based upon listening to what william and, and robin were saying and and we've got as i say we've got clients near shore and uh, offshore in a host of different countries and we don't experience these sorts of problems um you know primarily because of course the outsourcers are extremely proficient at um uh, that cult cultural alignment, I think it's just an educational thing with our prospective clients to understand that particular point. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, that would be my, my yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I want to move on to the impact of technology. We've had a few questions around that, and also, um, the, the, the poll results have come in as well. Um, so the poll results, the first, first question we're asking is, um, is the introduction of new technology a key driver to reduce reliance on headcount within your business? Um, so again, I guess the question I want to sort of pose is, 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 is automation, AI, is technology making certainly you know, UK-based outsourcers more competitive? Um, is, do you know, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, uh, technology is, is definitely having uh, an impact, particularly, you know, the improvements in machine learning, natural language processing, uh, both derivatives of AI uh, in helping to automate and, and enhance self-serve, uh, whether it be a concierge bot to, uh, to sort of capture initial customer information before passing through to a, a live advisor, um, or indeed um, dealing with knowledge management and, and, and giving answers in a a simple fashion to customers. Um, of course, that, that helps reduce age to T and by default uh, headcount too. Uh, yeah. is, it, is it moving the dial significantly though in terms of overall cost? Um, I would say it's making an inroad, I, but I, would, I don't think we're, we're there yet, but with the improvements that we've, we've got now with, with AI and, and, and the ability to create more intelligent bots, and we have our own uh, bot framework that we do just this at the moment. It's getting better, and it will and it will it will make and deliver further cost improvements as as we go forward. Yeah, yeah. Uh, William, my view on it is um, very much that over the lifetime of a contract, if you have that right buy-in with the client to try pilot proof of concept with technology, what rather than decrease straight away any headcount over the lifetime of contract. What I think it allows us to do is help those clients grow the markets that they want to penetrate into without actually having to grow the operational uh, footprint to support it. Because those ways of looking at transitioning away some of the high volume, low value transactions to, to technology uh, and therefore leaving really good quality, high, high value transactions for um, uh, employees is great, uh, but I think that's more where you've got the right technology-enabled CX analytics and insights piece to really help deliver that for the client. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, can I just can yeah. I just comment on that, Jonathan? Do you mind? Yeah, I think, yeah absolutely. I was going to get to you next. The other interesting point, and and Dino knows this because he was um, 
he was part of the pitch is is you know as we all know sometimes there are old legacy established contracts that are in place which are a very headcount driven i think i think those sorts of contracts are where a difference can be made you know and if the client is uh, prepared to go to market and and look at those contracts so for example We've got a we've got a big cosmetics client that we work with, um, which had circa 120 heads based in India, and um, you know um, we nearly moved it back to the UK, um, and and it was down to 50 heads. So that gives an example of you know with with, with good technology and application, um, you know you, there is the opportunity to. The UK to be a destination, um, you know. So uh, I think you know that there's a point with respect to those big established legacy contracts that possibly technology can aid to move them back or move them to the UK or any other destination. But Robert, what's your what's your perspective from a technology view? Well, look, I, I think you know in South Africa we've got several leading digital and technology firms and. These organizations are co-creating solutions for the GBS and BPO space, which has got a customer-centered approach. And I think the low-end repetitive work is what we're seeing being replaced and the current talent and employees are being upskilled and reskilled in new ways to continue to support the customer and ensure brand stickiness. But I think what we are finding with these low-end, low-value interactions, which have been sort of taken over by some of these more automated processes, is that there's definitely still a demand for a higher value voice engagement. You know, I don't think we're going to lose that human to human uh, connection because, uh, you know, there's multi generations uh, that have a requirement to engage with us as outsourcers and, and not all of them are really digitally au fait. And, and I would think that whilst it's got a big play, I, I support what Dino was saying as well. You know, the, the, the fear mongering that was spread several years ago about the fact that within the next five years, there won't be a call center agent breathing on a floor. Um, I, I don't really support. I, I think there's going to be a transition uh, into sort of uh, best of breed technology and it'll evolve over time. But I think that human to human interaction and the ability for an advisor to do multiple tasks simultaneously uh, will be there aided by AI bots and technology. But, you know, South Africa is, is slowly but surely maturing in that space but we are still very much um sort of a human breathing uh, warm body on a seat uh yeah. pitch and, and destination right um okay so what we touched touched on brexit earlier but um i want to talk about data now um first of all just looking at data security um are, are there future fewer challenges if you're using a uk-based uh outsourcer dino what's your views on that yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, the UK benefit is more of a, a legal and compliance one rather than, than technological. Um, you know, when we look at, at, at data privacy, there are, there are certainly fewer challenges uh, when the outsourcer is based in the same legal jurisdiction as the data subjects, as, as obviously the outsourcer is already aligned to the needs of its customers. Um, if, you're looking, if you're looking outside of the UK, you would expect... Uh, fewer challenges in, in countries that have a, a, a directly comparable legal structure. Um, or, of course, you select a UK company, uh, the one company that has a UK parent company as their head office, which can, can kind of help that. But um, how has Brexit affected that? You know, with, with obviously, I know there's issues around the UK's data adequacy, um, and, and, yeah. and there's been more news around that. But have you noticed any impacts? It's had little impact so far, um, and that's uh, in terms of GDPR, and that's mainly due yeah. to, to interim arrangements. Um, we haven't really seen seen an impact. I mean, pretty much the UK Data uh, uh, Protection Act copies the essence of the EU's GDPR uh, anyway, so there's little to react to. I suppose what's going to what we have to monitor uh, moving forward is the, the divergence of UK legislation. So. Yeah. You know, if, if we do start changing our own legislation, then we might have to reevaluate the uh, adequacy in terms of GDPR. Yeah. And William, what about, obviously, you've got operations in Eastern Europe and also within the UK. Um, yeah, so, so for, for us, Jonathan, we, um, we now straddle 
three different uh, data protection uh, regions with the UK, uh, Eastern Europe and Turkey. And so for us really, um, yes, it presents more complexity, but it's complexity that there are mechanisms that we can deal with that complexity. Um, obviously, if you've got a UK client or you've got a European client and data spread between the different uh, regions, it does, you know, you do make decisions around where the data should actually reside. Should it be in UK or should it be in Europe and in Dublin or Frankfurt? Um, but really, I think for us, it's um, now almost the first thing that we would look at when we're doing a piece of client work is, okay, where's the data aspect to it? Because it has become so important for us with those uh, protection areas that we now have to service. Right, yeah. And Robin, from a South African perspective, how are you, uh, you know, with handling data or any issues there? And what's uh, your point of view? I don't believe there is, Jonathan, and, and I'm not sure that many people know this, but South Africa is also the secretariat and convener of the Customer Contact Center ISO Service Standards, ISO 18295. And we worked with a global team, including the UK's British Standards Institute. So, you know, the thinking and methodologies in, in, in the security framework have been included in many BPR operations. Uh, you know, we, we've got people like Amazon and Azure investing billions of rand uh, in infrastructure in South Africa. We've got our own GDPR equivalent called the Poppy Act, which is as stringent, if not more stringent than GDPR. Uh, many, many uh, customers and operators in South Africa are ISO 27001 compliant uh, and certified. Um, uh, King 4 as a governance model is born out of South Africa and is embedded into our Companies Act. And over and above, we've got a very strict financial controls and a very strict uh, banking system and, and credit act and control system. So, yeah. you know, as far as understanding data security, information security, dealing with the import and export and processing of data, um, I, I don't see many issues there at all. I mean, we work a yeah. lot in financial services and insurance. Uh, I'm an appointed person of the Financial Conduct Authority from the UK. We work as an authorized rep. So we have very close scrutiny and, 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 and regulatory oversight from the governing bodies like the ICO and the FCA in the UK. So I think it's kept South Africa on the straight and narrow. Okay. And, and I think if you, if you choose the right outsourcer, uh, and there are obviously multiple outsourcers in South Africa that have the capabilities, you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's interesting. Um, Phil, what, what have you found clients um, having concerns or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think I think my point was going to just reiterate what Robin concluded with there. I think it's all about finding the right outsourcer. You know, around around this panel, you know, we've got three fantastic outsourcers that adhere to every regulation and every policy. You know, but um, mistakes can be easily made by selecting the wrong outsourcer, irrespective of geography. You know, and and there lies your challenge. So when um, that, that, for me, that for me is the, the overriding point, as Robin rightly said, it's about selecting the right outsourcer that's got the right processes, not necessarily all the time about the right authorities and, you know, regulatory boxes ticked, but um, definitely processes as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so we're getting very close to the end of the session now. Um, one thing we haven't talked about was, it was actually around the homeworking. Um, it would be really interesting to get your views of, of, of how it's impacted your operations over the last you know, 14 months um, and, and if, you know, if, if that will continue in the future and what you sort of, uh, what, what you, what you, how you think uh, your operations will change possibly, whether you'll you know, adopt a hybrid model or, or, or continue with how you're working now. Um, so, so do you know what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, we, we had um, a reasonably sizable home working contingent before the pandemic so it was much easier for us to, to transition to the full home working uh, requirement come the end of March last year um, I mean I, without doubt we've we've seen some fantastic examples of of, um, of it, you know great productivity you know a lot of staff absolutely love it I, I don't think we're going to force people back into the office but we're going to certainly adopt a hybrid model um, and it will all be based around um, you know what the output quality and also staff morale and all of those the myriad of different things for me um, physical uh, locations are still very important particularly in light of the type of work that we do um, 
as we know, customer service can be a, a thankless task, you know, and yeah. very rarely are people making contact to tell you you're fantastic and uh, they love your product. So, so you know, the, the environment, the camaraderie and everything that goes with physical locations, I think, is still very important. But undoubtedly, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of home working and it, it's uh, it'll play a big part in what we do moving forward. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so Robin, what's from your perspective? What, what have you, organ your organisation, how's that work? Yeah, look, South Africa has had significant success with home working. It's been an extraordinary evolution in us as operators understanding the capabilities of our advisors and the ability to migrate to work from home. It's been extraordinary. Uh, I, I think the one caution that I would give and the one thing that we're really experiencing now is that agents that have been working at home for the past several months or year and I believe that it's across the UK, Eastern Europe, and, and all over the world. They've spent a lot more time with their families because they haven't had to travel. And yeah. they've saved a significant amount of money because they haven't had to pay for transport. The, the, the almost reluctance for some of them to come back into the office because they're now having to withdraw from that lifestyle and start contributing again to their uh, transportation yeah. is quite a big challenge and something that I think we really need to recognize and 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 find ways to deal with. So that's the one thing. I, I think the majority of operators in this country will continue to operate with some sort of hybrid model. Uh, we still we had about 85% people working from home at, at the worst case of lockdown, and we're down to about uh, 18 to 20% at the moment work from yeah. home still. But I think it will continue. Okay. So, so, so William, what's your... Um... Well, I'm waving a tiny little census flag here yeah. at the moment, uh, Jonathan, because we, we were a gold winner at the, the recent European Contact Centre and Public Service Awards for Leadership in a Crisis. And it really was about what we've done from, with, with work from home uh, and, and all the other elements that uh, came to the fore that were needed is uh, both the ability to mobilise and stabilise and then optimise what happened during yeah. the pandemic. Um, I think absolutely work from home is now part of the proposition. Uh, we haven't really given a shout out really to the UK Contact Centre Forum, but for many years, they've run a very good forum called the Home Agent Forum. Uh, and I was part of that for a long time. And it was a great myth of UK outsourcing that home working was something that was never spoken about. And yet banks were doing it. And um, and you can almost always tell. Um, one car insurance provider that I use, I asked, I asked the, the customer agent, are you working from home? And they said, yes, because you just hear the, the ease with which they were dealing with the call. There's just a, a an ambiance around the, the way they were handling that customer engagement, which could tell you they're working from home. Without a doubt, that's going to be um, a big play going forward. But I do think the other thing that outsourcers and um, in-house need to look at is the the technology dividend for the employee. You know, yeah. where's where's the employee, or rather, where's the employee dividend out of the use of new technologies? Okay. It shouldn't all be just about the customers. It has to be that the employee also benefits, whether it's in the way they have um, employee engagement and we were finalists with the UK uh, Innovation Awards recently simply around this piece you know how are you making sure that technology is also helping those people in the, your business to be engaged uh, and obviously that affects all the things that we like to to, to focus on retention and, and quality of care to the customer uh, yeah. but yeah that, that's the one thing I would say out of this pandemic there has to be an employee dividend of the use of technology in our businesses yeah Okay, so we're going to wrap up now, but I just wanted to ask everyone, um, or certainly the, the outsourcers who are involved here, uh, if you've got three words, so I'm going to ask Robin, um, what would you, the three words you would say to, the, with just your positive words about, about offshore outsourcers, or why you would outsource offshore? Uh, three, uh, words. Uh, three words. <laughs> three, th three words. Quality, yeah. cost, and convenience. Okay. Over to you, William, about near shore. Well, actually, it would be quality, cost, and convenience, very much depending <laughs> on what it is you're trying to achieve. And Dean, how's it finish? Goodness. Uh, well, it will be high quality, uh, <laughs> uh, supreme governance and compliance, and, um, and peace of mind. There you go. All right, well, thank you very much for all your time today to all the panellists. Um, we've, had, we've had lots of questions. We probably haven't managed to answer them all, but we'll we'll try and get back to you. Um, we will be holding future sessions around around on this topic because it's, it's, a, it's a lot to talk about. 
Um, but I think it's been really, really interesting and insightful. Um, following this session, we'll we'll send out a link to the to the video recording. So if you want to watch it again or uh, pass it on to somebody else to to, to watch, um, you can do that. But um, but thank you very much and um, have a enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thank, thank you. Very much. Thank, thank you. Bye bye.